Today I want to talk about this man. Who is this man that Andrew Jackson Davis? He's known as the father of spiritualism or the uh, seer of the uh, Poughkeepsie, which is a little town in New York. And what is it about this man that we attach these titles to? And why I think it is vital that all of us should get to know him better. Whether you are a spiritualist or just spiritual or even as an atheist. And what impact does this man have on the you know, general history of the whole United States? So on August 11th, which is coming up next week, in 1826, Andrew Jackson Davis was born in a little town up near Hudson River in New York. His father was pretty unstable in terms of finance and, and also he was an alcoholic. His mother was barely educated, illiterate from what I understand, but religious at the same time. And Davis had hardly any education whatsoever, no schooling. I believe he only had something like three months or five months of formal education. And of course he read very few books had opportunity to do so. But he did have this pleasant personalities and disposition and an endless curiosity in everything. Now, at an early age, he became an apprentice to a shoemaker, just like his father, for two years. And then the whole family moved to New York, a place called Poughkeepsie. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. So when he was 17 years old, he saw a traveling mesmerism, which is the uh, term, it's the current term for hypno hypnosis in today's term. Uh, that mesmeriz me mesmerism was given by a professor of a medical college passing by. Now, at first, it did not affect him at first, Andrew um, Jackson Davis. It didn't affect him at all, that hypnosis. But he did find it very fascinating and interesting. So sometime after that, a local tailor by the name of William Livingston stopped by, and he himself was experimenting with his own mesmerism at the time. And he tried it on Davis. And guess what? He found that Davis was an ex extraordinary clairvoyant. Now, in the book, which I'm reading, almost done, the Magic Staff, an autobiography of Andrew Jackson Davis. In that book, he talks about how weird the sensation of going into that state. And he described it as very disturbing at first because he had no idea what it was about, the semi or unconscious state that he was in. And when he came around, he found all these people looking at him in awe and with eyes wide open. So he knew something was going on. Well, Livingston told him things that he did, such as, you know, uh, uh, talking about a book without opening a page, putting letters or things on um, his forehead while he was in a hypnotic state with eyes closed and able to tell everything. Now he told people about their illness, disease, and the treatment, which usually work, without any medical knowledge or even reading a book about it, as we understand. So his news spread from town to town very quickly, as you might imagine. And uh, he also, one of the things that he did during trans in that state was that he described life after death. He supposedly saw what happens to the soul during the actual dying process in which the spirit leaves the body and forms this new spiritual being. And he was able to do this at will, to visualize this. Now he talked about the universe that people did not even know about at the time. Uh, for example, uh, two planets, Neptune and Pluto, which years later, the science discovered it. He even saw the moons um, 
with the Neptune and Pluto, he even saw the moons circul um, circling Neptune. And I believe that he said there were six moons that he saw in his vision from his perspective, because he could actually, in astro, astrally, he can go to these planets and saw what the makeup was, what the air was made of, what the ground was made of. So these moons, he called it a satellite, uh, is what he called it uh, at the time. And there were six moons, and many years later, we now know that there are eight moons, but these two moons were actually very far out from the Neptune. So in his viewing from perspective where he says he was there, he only saw six. And I think that's even more amazing in itself. So in 1846, for about 15 months period, he dictated during this hypnotic state and mesmeric state. And uh, in his state, he wrote 30 books, which was dictated. Um, and then, and many different editions after that. Now, after a while, as this started to roll and get better, he didn't need to be in the mesmeric state, hypnotic state, and he called it superior consciousness or, uh, or super consciousness, which meant that he was wide awake, but at will, he was able to obtain the knowledge, the physical knowledge, the universal knowledge, and the medical knowledge of things that he could see and visualize in his vision with his eyes wide open, wide awake. So when we refer to people who are awake, awakening, you see, you hear and see people nowadays, especially that, oh, you know, I'm becoming awakening and awoken. I think we have to be careful when using the words awaken because unless you are like Andrew Jackson Davis, who were super conscious, were able to obtain these things freely at will, that's being awakened, like Buddha, Jesus Christ, and of that nature. So, <coughs> excuse me. So that's the state that he was in. Um, he did prescribe some uh, medicines and some weird, by our standards, you know, getting some animal parts and this and then boil this and that. And later he described that in that parts, there were some substance, chemical makeup that made the illness disappear. So that's how he, he did. Now, um, in his book, he wrote many books, like I said, uh, The Nature of Universe, which dealt with the natural law. He talks about the studying of the nature, which as a spiritualist, we understand that, the natural law. And he said that in, in that nature, all that divine is in that nature, is what he said in that book. In another book, um, The Great Harmonia, he talks about how we evolve from plants to animals to every man and woman and children alike, all the way up to our humans. So that sounds a lot like Darwinism. It is. And this happened like 10 years before Darwin wrote The Origin of Species. Now, when he did this, he got in a lot of trouble, of course, <laughs> way before Darwin did. Now, some of his other future predictions were such as like typewriters, automobiles, and many things in, in describing it in, in very good detail and accuracy. So, and on the morning of March 31st, 1848, and some of you might know that date, how important that date is, he wrote in his diary saying that there comes a new era of awakening spiritually. And he did not use spiritualism at the time, but you know we know what happened that, that day in New York, in Highsville, New York, with the Fox and Sisters, and the rapping and the spirit communication began. So that's why he's referred to as the John the Baptist of spiritualism, because he foresaw the coming of spiritualism. Oh, yeah. So... 
undoubtedly, when he was in super consciousness, that in itself is an amazing thing. But, and we talk about how great he was, how accurate prediction that he made, his prophecies. But what I want to talk about is his philosophy. Because sometimes as a spiritualist, we overlook what's in it, the, the, the fruit of this knowledge and the philosophy that he talks about. Now, whether you are a spiritualist, whether you are a Christian or atheist or whatever religion that you aspire to, it doesn't matter because underneath all that, when you read his writings and philosophies, he's, he's talking about the humanity first and, and the love and the truth and the reasoning and the right reason, mankind. So that's what he talks about in the philosophy. Now also, I just want to point out that it is a fact that through Civil War uh, documents in the modern history research that Davis and Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, actually met several times. So Davis had visited the White House to meet with Lincoln. And when Lincoln was in New York, he made a point to see Andrew Jackson Davis. We also know it's a well-known fact that First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln, the wife of Lincoln, was uh, practiced spiritualism in the White House. And he did this with a young woman medium, uh, Nettie Colburn. So with that, eventually advising Lincoln with the Spirit's Voice and the Emancipation Proclamation in July of 1862. Now, on the side note, uh, besides Andrew uh, Jackson Davis, we also know the role of spiritualism and the women's movement known as the women's suffrage that started the ball rolling and cemented the 19th Amendment to U.S. Constitution that gave every woman the right to vote. Without spiritualism, without the people in it, this would not have not happened. Now, such principle, these philosophies, I believe, is a gem of spiritualism. And it's just something that we should talk about and get to know Andrew Jackson Davis. It's not, in his, if you read his philosophy throughout, it's not about structure, dogma, or creed. And he talks about the liberty and the freedom of people from it. And that gets repeated over and over again. <clears throat> but Andrew Jackson Davis, later in his life, he actually stayed shied away from spiritualism. Now, why is that, you ask? So in the beginning, when the Fox sisters and the phenomena started, as you can imagine, everybody got on the bandwagon with the phenomena all the mediums, all the trans people, and the performance and you know on stage and of that nature. So as you can imagine, there were lots of fraudulent activity phenomena going on that he detested. Um, so there were less genuine spiritual phenomena, but more fraudulent activities and which gave spiritualism bad name at the time. So he actually stayed away from spiritualism. <clears throat> you know, just as Buddha was not a Buddhist, and Jesus at the time, he wasn't a Christian. So most Christian church churches that I know are not about Jesus' teaching. It's about flashy buildings, expensive, you know, buildings, what's inside, rock and roll bands, uh, famous pastors. It's not about Jesus teachings anymore but it's about wanting and becoming Christian so this is where Andrew Jackson Davis talks about even back then that I can relate to now that we can all relate to um, here's an article of writing that Andrew Jackson Davis did that I really admire and like that I <clears throat> read over and over again now imagine he wrote many many books uh, some of the books are hard to read um, hard to follow, perhaps, but there is one uh, reading, our article that he wrote, and which is an interesting because <clears throat> uh, 
uh, not many people know about this, but he wrote an article of writing um, that is called The Spiritual Declaration of Independence. Does anyone, how many people have heard of that? Okay, so some of you. Now, he wrote this in May 31st, in 1851, and I find it just as meaningful now and pertinent now than ever. <clears throat> now, I'm going to quote a few things from this article, and which is pretty easy to understand. <clears throat> Here he writes, <coughs> excuse me, my throat, excuse me, wait, that will be edited out. <laughs> so, he writes, we hold it to be self-evident truth that the principle of reason is the greatest and highest endowment of the human mind. And then he goes on to say, we hold this reason to be the divinely inherited treasure of the human soul because it sees the indications, studies, the principles, and progressively comprehends the countless and infinitely diversified manifest manifestations of the universal truth and God. And he talks about this reason, and he talks about how you can find easily in, in looking at the nature. And then he writes and says, furthermore, we hold it to be the nature and tendency and divine prerogative of the human soul to explore, to investigate, to classify, and reduce to a practical application every thought and principle and science and philosophy and religion which rests upon the everlasting foundation of the universe. So he talks about looking at the nature and the science where he's talking about the universe and planetary and the forces in that. And likewise, that it's a man's nature freely and fearlessly with an eye to the truth to examine all science and discoveries and mythologies and theologies and religion which have been or may be developed among men and that if you if you do not come to accord with the immutable principles of nature and reason it is our divine right and authority to openly expose and repudiate and discard them all and then he lists like nine reasons in this Declaration of Independence from Religion of, uh, and reminding us why this is needed. And one of the things that I want to point out in this uh, reasons is that organization or structure of society as we have it engenders personal and national animosity. Saying how it's not so good to have all these rules and rigid church uh, dogma and doctrines and things of that nature. And then Davis also lists why we are moved to declare free and independent of the existing forms and institutions of theology. He says, it assumes to be or to possess within its organization and cardinal doctrines and it arrogantly claims itself to be the supreme and sovereign authority. He's talking about the dogma and creed here, I believe. He says, it emphatically justifies society in the perpetuation of personal and national animosities and antagonism. And Davis talks about how he, how it keeps up a, 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 a constant struggle, warfare between our mind and our heart whether you're a spiritual person or you're in a politics or law or whatever you are, or as an educator. So there's this constant warfare going on because of all this dogma and creed and all this rigid rules are in, in society depend, demand on. 
And finally, and this is what I like, Davis lists these things. He says, our book, with a capital B, our book is nature. Our master is reason. Our law is love to men and women. Our religion is justice. Our light is truth. Our path is progression. Our works are development. Our heaven is harmony. And then he says to understand what harmony is, we individually, we have to be in a harmonious way and not fight it. Because for every human spirit is a finite embodiment of the infinite intelligence. So he talks about, it's very pertinent nowadays, what's going on out in the world. But, you know, this harmony must begin with individual, but it will then spread over our community, your family, and it will flow through our veins and our hearts. And then the whole will represent the individual and the individual, the whole, and the God or the infinite will be all in all. And that's what he writes. So here's a man who not only did great things for spiritualism, I mean, I believe that without him, with his philosophies, that spiritualism would not be here, not just by fo the Fox sisters <clears throat> and the phenomena, because the phenomena is phenomena, but without the philosophy and the meaning and truth and the logic and the reason, there is no such um, spiritualism, I believe. Um, when I went to Arthur Finley College, my, my teacher and my mentor, Mavis Petula, I remember her saying, which I found odd at the time, that she said that the spiritualism is not about mediumship. I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm here to learn mediumship. But, or it's not, nor it's not about a religion, she says, but to spiritualize every human being on earth. Now, when she said that, I thought, well, that's, isn't that what Christianity is about, to convert people? But it's not. <clears throat> you can be an atheist, but you can be a spiritualized. And I believe that's what spiritualism is. And through love and reason and truth and human mind and spirit, and I think that exists spiritualism. Now, I know far more <clears throat> friends of mine and families that are not really spiritual or have anything to do with spiritualism, but I know in my heart there are already awakened, higher conscious spiritualists in my book. So lastly, some of you might know <coughs> uh, the story about the magic staff with uh, uh, Davis. This is how in his vision later in his life that he met Galen, the Greek uh, physician, and Emmanuel Swedenborg, a Swedish uh, scientist and author and um, the forerunner of the spiritualism. And from his astral message up in the sky was revealed to him the true nature of his magic, the magic staff. It says, and some of you might know this already, Behold, here is thy magic staff. Under all circumstances, keep an even mind. Take it, try it, walk with it, believe on it forever. See, this staff was not an object, but a principle. Now, these simple words, simple words, as easy as it sounds, I find it extraordinarily difficult to do it every day in every instance. I, I don't know who does this 24 seven. <laughs> I lose it sometimes and I'm like, ah, oh, crap, <laughs> I did that again. But, you know, this is what we have to strive to as a spiritualist, to be kind, to loving, and keep an even mind. When he says about keep an even mind, it's, it's, it's the 
you know, when you go down so much, but not at the same time, not go so high up where you are so elated and you're so like, blah, 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 blah. so he's talking about keeping even mind, even with that, you know, to keep it. So I ask all of you to walk the path of harmonious love and reason. So individually and as a whole, we can progress in the philosophy of spiritualism. Thank you. There you go.